All right, I think we talked about uh, most of it. There are a couple of just other little things, and that is laughter. Laughter therapy is something that's an ongoing field. They have laughter yoga clubs, and um, this has real science behind it. So you can show that if you force somebody to laugh, I don't care why they're laughing, just force it. Just act the part, even if you're not, you don't think it's funny, you think it's stupid, just laugh. If you laugh, it turns out that you boost antibody levels against, if you're vaccinated against some vaccine, well, you know what, if you're laughing in that 24-hour period, your, your uh, antibody levels are a lot higher. Unbelievable. Uh, just from the process of, of laughing. Um, and laughing reduces your cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And laughing also reduces some of the catecholamines, these stress hormones. And the way I envision it, you have this, you've got the two sides of our brain here. You know, you've got the negative side, the frown side, anger, fear, sadness, and you've got the smiling laughter side. And we're constructed this way because you can just imagine as a caveman 50 years ago, there might have been some good reasons sometimes that you should be frowning and maybe you should be hiding in that cave. You shouldn't be jumping up and down when there's a war going on. You want to hide, right? And then conversely, you, you just captured some food. Everybody's happy. You need to de-stress because you can't be stressed all the time. So you, you all start smiling and laughing at each other. So it's sort of a restorative uh, yin-yang, restorative facial expression. And um, you can show that uh, laughter... You know, it's it's remarkable what it can do in terms of you know the various parts of the immune system, and then conversely, if you are depressed, it profoundly affects not just your mental health. So people who are depressed have a fourfold risk of getting of dying from a heart attack, fourfold increased. Uh, they also have a a big increase in cancer if they're depressed, and uh, smiling and laughing. I believe it, even if you're not happy can help because it's going to decrease your stress hormone. So it's not it's not magic that these facial expressions are doing something uh, to your overall health. They're affecting levels, key levels of different hormones that are circulating in your bloodstream at all times. And, um, and as a final note, I just, when people ask me, well, how can a muscle in the face really do this? And I just bring them to thinking about yoga. I think yoga is pretty accepted now, that if you get really good in yoga, wow, yoga is powerful in causing relaxation. What is yoga? I mean, you were focusing on our breathing, and we're learning to focus on our diaphragm, a muscle right here that controls our breathing. So how does a muscle controlling your breathing affect your brain? It's a good question. But it just brings up the point that your muscles and your brain are just completely intertwined. There is no one versus the other. And um, thank you very much. My question has to do with what does Botox actually do? Is it that it relaxes uh, the muscles? What does it do and why is it that people have to continually go back for treatments that you can't just do it one time and it lasts? Sure, great. And that's what, you know, from a scientific thing. But you've made me so conscious because <laughs> I have a fill in here. And now I'm wondering if I'm in trouble. And You're it's, not in trouble. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cheap. But no. my mother had it and my grandmother had it. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I said, well, you practice still? Yes. Okay, well, I'm going to look you up and, uh, and get a checkup. So anyway, tell us what does it do? And, uh, sure. Yeah, because well, I don't want to be angry or depressed. Right. Everybody wants to feel good and look good. Sure. Well, uh, Botox, what, what it does is it inhibits the nerve cells from re releasing this chemical called acetylcholine. And this chemical is necessary for the nerve to transmit its message so that the muscle can move. So when you inject it in here, over a period of a couple of weeks, 
you you inhibit the ability of the muscle to contract, and it's a gradual thing. It just it just takes time for all the muscle fibers to be affected, even though you inject in two seconds and it's done. And then it wears off. Your nerves regenerate, and they make some new product that isn't inhibited by this stuff. So gradually, over three to four months, it wears off, and that's why, on average, every three to four months, people will repeat so it. So then they go back to looking like they did before? Uh, that's, an, that's a <laughs> fascinating question, but the answer is usually not. Because it turns out that uh, um, the muscles, they get into habits. It's like anything else. You get into a habit. Now, if you haven't frowned for six months, even if you have no Botox, usually the muscle says, oh, okay, well, I guess I don't need to frown as much as I used to because things were good for a while. So it sort of gets out of the habit. I call it the, um, it's like reverse weightlifting. All right, you go to the gym, you want to get stronger. Well, you go to the Botox gym because you want that muscle to get weaker. You don't really want to look sad and feel sad. So you'd rather that be a little bit weaker. And if you do it a few times, the muscle just gets less active. It, it, I, I've seen people who've done it like three, four times, and they stopped doing it for a few years. The frown never came back as badly as it was before I treated them. Well, has anybody mm -hmm. suffered really drastically from it? Did you know? Of, of course not in your practice. We can't hear the question. <laughs> has any, uh, yeah, let me repeat it. So has anybody... Mm -hmm. you know, bad results. I mean, really. I personally haven't had problems. I, I mean, said I know in your practice. Yeah, I mean, I think, <laughs> I, I think it's um, it, it's a very safe drug if used by somebody who knows how to use it, uh, as long as you're using the real thing. I mean, it's like anything else. If, if you if somebody has somebody who's not has no training in it and is using something counterfeit or something, then uh, good luck. But uh, you know, if if used how it's supposed to be used. It's incredibly safe. Uh, it, it, uh, so I, I, I think it's safer than um, anything that involves actual surgery because it's not irrevocable. It wears off. Is there one more question here? Hi, Hi honey. Really how are you? Wonderful. What a wonderful speech. It was really wonderful. And I'm actually curious about something. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? Can you hear it? I'll step up closer to the Oh, sure. Uh, so, uh, you know, being a light worker and a healer, I work with the energy centers and the chakras quite a bit. And of course, the facial expression says a lot because of the energy part of it. And of course, I love that you talked about meditation and yoga and all of that. And laughter is a huge part of this. So I was so curious when the individuals did receive this Botox, were there any kind of sort of like assignment to laugh, go on a, you know, a laughter assignment and meditation or something just so that this could be something as a part of their daily practice so that can really shift the changes in their life? Great question. So um, in our studies, we tried to control for anything. So we essentially didn't talk to the patients at all. We just did the injection, the psychiatrist spoke to them. <coughs> I actually never spoke to any of the patients. I had somebody else do the injection, so it was completely blind. But in uh, when it's not blind and I'm treating somebody, you know, I do talk about that. I have no um, evidence, scientific evidence, in terms of depression, that smiling and laughter should help it. But from everything I've read, and there are hundreds of studies out there. I'm just convinced that uh, it should. And so, I, I mean, I have mentioned to people, you know, if, if let's say they're depressed and they don't want to do Botox, fine. Then maybe while they're driving to work every day, that's a big waste of time, right? So you can either get mad at the person in front of you, or you can just start laughing the whole way down, and there's nobody to get you embarrassed because you're in the car by yourself laughing. So who cares? Right? And you lose nothing, and you're laughing the whole way. And I think that uh, laughter is completely under-recognized as a treatment for health. Now, if you historically go back in time, you'll see that um, in the 1300s, physicians who didn't really have much else in their little doctor bag used to uh, prescribe laughter. That was a huge thing. Um, and uh, it, it's, you know, 
it was a much bigger part of medicine, and laughter just kind of fell out of favor because people used to have bad teeth because nobody had a dentist. This is true. And so it, everybody was ashamed to open their mouth in the 1700s. It was considered poor taste to laugh. In public, they said only the peasants did it. Well, I say everybody should be laughing. But I mean, you have quotes from these earls in the 1700s who disparage laughing like it's some evil thing. And when you realize that, you know, half the teeth were missing, they were rotten, the gums looked terrible, then you're sort of like, okay, I, I guess I kind of get it, why they were so down on laughter. But um, the truth of the story is that uh, laughter is tremendous, smiling is tremendous, and uh, it's been a burgeoning field since Norman Cousins wrote his book, The Anatomy of an Illness, and he talked about how he laughed his way through his is terrible arthritis. He had so much pain because laughter is good at reducing pain. It is. It, it, you know, he said he would he would watch a Groucho Marx film, and for every half an hour of Groucho Marx, he would get two hours pain free. Remarkable. And he wrote that you know quite a while ago. But I believe it. It's true. It's real. It's just that there are social um, prohibitions against laughter. If you just start laughing, all of a sudden everybody's going to look at you like, okay, you're either crazy or I need to get away from you. I mean, there's something wrong, right? And um, and that's wrong, and we need to change that. Society should accept laughter. Um, you know, children do get depressed, but they certainly don't get depressed as often as adults. And one thing that always intrigued me was that kids laugh all the time. If you see some kids out playing, do you ever see them playing, you know, for an hour without giggling and laughing? I think it's good. I think it's healthy. And somehow when we become adults, it's like, hmm, now that's frowned upon. You shouldn't laugh. You're serious now. So you're not allowed to laugh. So, uh, and that's a big mistake. So, I, and, you know, all these pathways probably all interconnect. Yoga, meditation. Uh, I would not be surprised if you, when you find, when you do the imaging, that you find that the Botox, the yoga, the meditation are all coming around different ways, but coming up to the same place. Okay. Sure. Quick one. You talked about how um, your studies were working with the depressed patients who did not respond to other treatments. Um, Most of them. Uh, some of them hadn't tried anything, but the majority had tried antidepressants. And would it work? Do you think it would work with people that respond to other treatments and as an alternative to uh, antidepressants? I, I see no reason not to think that way because some of the patients were depressed, but for whatever reason, they just didn't want to take a pill. And there was a subgroup of people who didn't want to take a pill no matter what. They had been depressed for years, but they just sort of lived with it. And those people have the same response rate. I mean, they did just as well as the people who were on the antidepressants. But uh, it's hard to recruit people for a depression study unless they've already failed the other things, because then they're thinking, well, this normal stuff doesn't work. I might as well try this. So between the question. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, the, nothing was statistically significant, but. Um, you know, a group that did very well were ones that were still depressed, that were taking one antidepressant, and then they then we added the Botox. That seemed to just sort of tip them into the happy range. You know, they they were already on something, but it wasn't it wasn't cutting it. They were still depressed, and then you had the Botox, and then they went up to the the normal level. But the numbers are too small to know actually in whom. It works the best, but it's a great question. But we did have nice success in people who were already on something. Okay, thank you so much.